Euromax highlights in today's show. In concert, Anna Sophie Mutter plays Brahms violin sonatas. Trends 2010 what to expect in the worlds of fashion, design, and architecture. Northern Lights a night in a glass igloo provides a unique view of the heavens in Finland. Euromax highlights. And here's your host, Robin Merrill. And a very warm welcome from Berlin. Scotland is famous for its whiskies. Indeed, scotch is almost a synonym for whisky. However, as long as you have the know-how and the machinery, it is possible to distill whisky almost anywhere. And there used to be a lot of whisky made in England. That was until the end of the 19th century when the last English distillery closed. But now an enterprising farmer is making English whisky once again, and it's all being done with the blessing of his Scottish counterparts. A handful of houses and then barley fields, as far as the eye can see. This is Rowdham, a seemingly typical village in the English countryside. But all that changed when a local farmer decided to start producing whisky. Since then, the village has become something of a tourist attraction. Andrew Nelstrup's family had grown barley for generations, selling it to Scottish distilleries for whiskey. Now, they use it themselves. They set up St. George's Distillery, their very own whiskey-making business. This is a dream of my father's to set up a whiskey distillery. So after generations of farming, we, uh, he, he's brought it up a number of times, and we finally gave in and said, OK, well, we'll make whiskey. Once the decision was made, everything went very quickly. The Nelstrips plundered their savings and set about building on their land. A Scottish firm produced the distillery equipment. They employed a master distiller, also from Scotland. Andrew says there was very little resistance in Scotland to the idea of English whiskey. The Scottish whisky industry have been incredibly supportive because every time we have a, an inch in a newspaper or a bit on TV, you're advertising whisky. And by advertising whisky, you are advertising scotch. So it's a good thing for them. And in the time it's taken to do this interview, they've made more whisky than we would make in a year. Therefore, Andrew Nelstrup concentrates on quality. Barley from the local region is first ground and then mixed with hot water. Yeast is added and allowed to ferment. The mash is then placed in a still. The liquid that comes out is clear. Whiskey only gains its characteristic color during the aging process. The Nelstrips had 1,000 bourbon barrels shipped from the U.S. and after three years, the first batch of whiskey has matured. This is the first business where we have interacted with the customer and it's been quite eye-opening actually i mean 99 percent of them are absolutely lovely and it's been fantastic to meet them all and and it's also a way to get feedback on your product people are incredibly honest if they don't like it they'll tell you members of the public are encouraged to come and look around and sample some of the whiskey pretty smooth St. George's Distillery attracts some 18,000 visitors a year. The on-site shop sells whiskey from all over the world. The site was officially opened in 2007 by Prince Charles, who signed two of the barrels. From a layman's point of view, it's a gentle, delicate, light whiskey. And by gentle, I mean it doesn't burn as it goes down. I think the whiskey critics come out with all sorts of things. It's got vanilla and it's nutty. And, but in, for those that are just going to drink it, it's a light, delicate, easy to drink whiskey. The English whiskey is now on sale throughout Europe, Canada, and Japan, as well as in the local pub. They serve more whiskey here than ever before since the local drink went on sale. A bottle of St. George's isn't exactly cheap. It costs around 40 euros, but it's hugely popular amongst the locals. 
It's very good that England, uh, we got our own whisky. Give this a few years maturing, it's really going to be up there with the best. It could be Welsh, it could be Japanese, but as long as it's good, and this is as good as anything could get. The first batch of English whisky available to the public has now sold out. Those who didn't manage to get one of the 1,800 bottles will have to wait for the next batch due in March. Christian Ava from here in Berlin actually began painting as a form of protest. As a teenager, he was a bit of a rebel and belonged to the illegal graffiti spraying scene. But he later mellowed out, as you do, and art became his passion. He still uses the spray can in his paintings today and his pictures regularly sell for five-figure sums. We met up with him at his studio not far from here, where he was busy preparing for a major exhibition. Christian Ava used to go around the city spray-painting graffiti. Even today, his work is meant more for the outside than inside. Spray painting is a technique that Ava has actually been practicing for years. It's about flowing colors and transitions, spraying as movement. It's about being physical. What I try to bring about in my pictures is a drive, a rhythm, an exciting composition. The paint itself is only one of several layers. Here he brings the background, the hidden picture, to the forefront. The technique is unique and it has brought Ava so much success that his pictures, like these on the landmark Berlin Boulevard Unter den Linden, are sold in major galleries. His large format pictures, like this changeable work called Struggle, can cost up to 50,000 euros. Many works, like Culture Deportation or Treibgut, which means flotsam, make socially critical statements which are understood universally. We've had several exhibitions with Christian. We present him at international art fairs. We have a large clientele and the works are very well received. It's exciting to see how broadly this has developed, from Istanbul to Seoul to Miami and New York, to see where pictures of mine hang, which installations we're in, which exhibitions I'm doing. From a working-class neighborhood to the glamorous art scene, Christian Ava grew up here in Berlin's Lichtenberg district, in a non-artistic family. It was the youth culture that influenced him once he started spray-painting graffiti. It was illegal, of course, but it made his career. Of course, graffiti was the foundation for me. Back then, I wasn't the least bit interested in art. Going to museums with my school or my parents was awful. But now it's different. Through graffiti, I came into a whole new sphere, to calligraphy, to design, to architecture, and then finally to painting. Ava landed unexpectedly in this class with Georg Baselitz, one of Germany's most important contemporary artists, at the University of the Arts in Berlin. Ava applied without knowing Baselitz and was one of the few accepted. Later, he pursued advanced studies with Daniel Richter. Today, Ava works in a 120-square-meter loft. The things he learned in his art studies connect him with his years spent learning street art. The special thing about my painting method is that it's a mixture of painting and drawing. My background is graffiti, which has a lot to do with lines. It's more drawing and rhythm than painting. And now i found a way to combine the two. And still, the street remains Ava's most important source of inspiration. His works deal with such topics as immigration or right-wing extremism, but also with sports.
In 2005, he was German streetball champion. It's not like I go into my atelier and suddenly I'm a painter. Art for me is a way of life. And what else should I be inspired by if not what goes on in my environment? And Christian Ava has remained in his home neighborhood of Lichtenberg, while his artworks hang in galleries around the world. Now, the German violinist Anna-Sophie Mutter was a child prodigy, discovered by Herbert von Karajan when she was just 13 years old. She went on to record numerous records with the Berlin Philharmonic while she was still in her teens. She's always looking for new ways of bringing classical music to a younger audience, and her latest recording of Brahms' sonatas on DVD puts you right up there on stage with her. Euromax met up with her on set in Bavaria. Ready? Anna Sophie Mutter is perfectly at home with state of the art video technology. Being able to see and hear a DVD and surround sound is the closest you can get to actually being at a concert, and it's incredibly exciting. Those who have never experienced the violin virtuoso live in concert will soon at least be able to purchase another DVD this time featuring her performance of three violin sonatas by Johannes Brahms. Brahms was a king of melodies. He was also extremely critical and would agonize over every note, perhaps even more than Beethoven. Maybe that's why everything we know by Brahms is of such quality, because he threw everything else away. Mutter has recorded the three violin sonatas by Brahms before, in 1983, when she was just 20 years old. It's been more than 25 years, and we've been performing the sonatas around the world, either as a block of three or individually. So after this, we felt obliged to provide a new perspective on these wonderful works. As Lambert used to say so sweetly, the apple is ripe and now it's time to pick it. American pianist Lambert Orcus has worked with Anna Sophie Mutter frequently for more than 20 years. They're a great team, one that can deal with challenges away from the world of music even if it's just finding the right switch. Ah, I see the light. Cool. The light goes on on my fiddle. For me, is music im Allgemeinen. I find chamber music especially stimulating because it demands an intense dialogue. And this dialogue with a long-standing musical partner like Lambert Orcus is very satisfying and at the same time a huge challenge. With Brahms, it's a dialogue that takes place on an equal footing, which isn't the case with the early sonatas of Mozart or Beethoven. The CD and DVD are being produced together incorporating cutting-edge technology and recorded in high definition. The Rococo Hall of a former library provides an ideal acoustic and visual backdrop. It all went so fast. Sometimes we only need one take for a sonata because the atmosphere was right and incredibly intense. And fortunately, it rained when we were recording the one in G major, so everything was perfect. Which was clear to see and hear. The CD and DVD are set for release in March. And in April, Anna-Sophie Mutter and Lambert Orcus will embark on a tour of Asia, taking the Brahms sonatas with them. 
And now look at what's possibly in store for us this year in the fields of fashion, design and architecture. We asked Mark Fuller, who's boss of a trend research agency in Hamburg, to look into his proverbial crystal ball and tell us what he thinks will be the major trends of 2010. The Hamburg agency NeoGuard is busy spotlighting the trends of tomorrow. Mark Fuller founded the agency about 10 years ago and consults with companies ranging from Gucci to Prada to Hugo Boss. Here are his trend forecasts for 2010. A main trend in fashion, among many others, is the next-centric trend. It's expressed through extremely extravagant and extremely colourful styles. It's very, very loud and it's very, very extreme. It's edging toward costume in fashion, and in the end, it's also a very strong expression of extreme individuality. American pop singer Lady Gaga was already hip to the trend in 2009. After all, extreme outfits make for good publicity. 80s fashions are back as a hallmark of the trend, as are flashy colors. Still, the black and white look is here to stay, for women and men. German singer Jan DeLay is proof positive that tailored suits are in, though it's time to up the color quotient for 2010. There's a very nature-based trend, and fashion will also have strong ties back to nature. You see it in terms of materials, and how fur is making a comeback, and coarse leather is coming back too. The wilderness is the second big fashion trend in 2010. Animal prints are the fashion highlight for next season. As it is with fashion, in the design field there's a progression back to earthy elements, to natural forms, natural materials, a departure from the perfect facade, away from the perfectly put together product and back to values-oriented representation and design. Exclusive pieces made from recycled rustic wood are one big design trend for 2010, as are more delicate floral motifs. In combination with technology and new production possibilities, a hybrid form of design is in the making. It has the same origins, namely the idea of getting back to nature, but technically implemented in a whole different way and perhaps also influenced by computer technology. This hybrid design aesthetic between nature and technology is seen in bioplastic furniture made of materials derived from potato plants plastic lamps reminiscent of tulips, or a metal table with a wood-like look. We're from an era where the focus was equalization, globalization, shopping centers that worked the same way in America and in Europe. That's all over now, and architecture is looking to erect landmarks, to draw people's attention and to do the opposite, to do things differently than in other regions and cities. Take for instance the newly opened Burj Khalifa Tower in Dubai, the world's tallest building. Or the Elbe Philharmonie in Hamburg, a half billion euro project. As in other areas, architecture is doing a lot of experimentation, and that means working with new production techniques and building structures that aren't technically possible, but are made possible. Star architect Zaha Hadid from Britain is a forward thinker when it comes to buildings that defy even today's technical know-how, and her structures are sure to keep pushing the envelope on the trend front in 2010. Nature and sustainability overall have become the standard. These things will have to be addressed. They will be addressed. The consumer will address it, and in that way it's something that's almost to the point of not being a trend anymore. Instead, it's really become a standard. Recycling, seen here in the form of fashions made from old workers' uniforms, will further affect many aspects of modern life in 2010. And designers are experimenting with a range of reusable materials when it comes to interior design, such as homes made from old shipping containers. 
and eco aesthetic and green thinking. From architecture to fashion, it's the leading trend for 2010. By the way, at the end of the year, we'll have a look and see if those predictions were right. Finally today, with large parts of Europe under more snow than they have ever seen in many years, we're going to the far north of Finland. Way inside the Arctic Circle, there's a rather special igloo village. Special because some of the igloos there are made out of glass. Thick glass, of course, and that ensures very pleasant warm temperatures inside. There, you can stare up into the night sky and experience one of the most spectacular natural light shows on Earth, the Aurora Borealis, perhaps better known as the Northern Lights. It's one of the world's more remote hotels and the only one comprising glass-domed igloos. Even during the chilly polar nights, the hotel attracts tourists from around the world. And this is the mastermind behind the idea, Yusi Airamo, who created the first glass igloo rooms in 1999. Yeah, The idea came from tourists coming here over an eight-month time frame to see the northern lights. And of course, they would get cold feet from waiting in temperatures of 30 degrees below. So I thought, how about watching the lights while in bed, inside? I ended up designing these glass igloos. Providing a clear view of the skies is tricky in architectural terms, as is the maintenance side. Special windows were also required that would neither freeze over nor steam up. They were absolutely crucial in the realization of UC Araimo's vision. I needed glass for these igloos and came across a Finnish invention, thermoglass. It heats the inside of the igloo and melts the snow outside. There's also a special little door designed to prevent heat escaping. Side curtains ensure privacy for guests while they enjoy undisturbed views of the skies over Lapland. With a bit of luck, guests can also see the legendary Northern Lights that turn the skies into a multicolored magical extravaganza. Jorge Alfaro and Guillermo Chavez have come all the way from Mexico to witness the unique spectacle. Unfortunately, the snowy recent weather has clouded their view of the skies and of the northern lights. But at least the night was a comfortable one. Even if outside were like, I don't know, like minus 20 degrees, inside it were like 20 degrees, so it's actually pretty hot. And um, well, it was quite good, but I just woke up like a couple of times because I was like sweating and all that stuff. <laughs> And uh, yeah, sometimes I just like realize we have no curtains or anything, so maybe just the, the lightest light woke me up. <laughs> the glass igloos cost 380 euros a night, so for most guests, it's a short stay. But the hotel village in Kaxlautanen also includes regular igloos. They're a bit cheaper and also a tad chillier. Jorge and Guillermo from Mexico City find below zero simply too low. I'm freezing right now and I don't, I don't see myself going through the night right if I sleep here. And the glass igloo is no like 20 degrees now, <laughs> so it's perfect. Guests can at least warm up in the restaurant, housed in a traditional log cabin. 
Today's specialty is smoked salmon from the Arctic Ocean. This is anything but fast food. It takes about an hour to prepare, but otherwise has fairly simple seasoning, salt and pepper. Even without the northern lights, it's been an unforgettable experience for the visitors from Mexico. And if you want to see any of those reports again or others from Euromax or DWTV in general, you'll find them on YouTube. Just type in Deutsche Welle English, all one word, and the choice is yours. That's all for today, though, so bye-bye.